Welcome everyone to the July, the July meeting of uh, Television Toastmasters. I'm Rick Davis, the outgoing president of TV Toastmasters, and I would like to introduce our Toastmaster for today, Nellie Bowen. Nellie. Thank you, Mr. President. Today, Steve Ehrenholz is going to be our word power master. And Steve, would you tell us why we have a word at every meeting? What's the purpose of having word power? Thank you, Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and our honored guests and those watching from home. The reason that we have word power as a part of our meeting is to help us increase the breadth of our vocabulary. It provides us with other options available to enhance and color our speaking. The two words that I have for today I obtained from the Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary website. The first one is from International English. The word is cack-handed. It's an adjective. It's from English dialect. Cack or keck, which means awkward. And the first meaning is for left-handedness. And the second use can be clumsy or awkward. An example would be her operation of the garden equipment was very cack-handed. The second word that I have for today comes from science and mathematics. It is vermiculture, which is a noun. It means the cultivation of annelid worms, such as earthworms or bloodworms, especially for use as bait or in composting. A usage example would be, his opening of a bait shop turned his vermiculture into a profitable business. Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Steve. Uh, today, our table topics master will be Carol Cormelang. And Carol, this is one of my favorite things in Toastmasters, but would you tell us why we have table topics and what we learn from doing that? Besides just having fun? <laughs> Madam Toastmaster and fellow Toastmasters, table topics, there's more to Toastmasters than just learning how to speak in public. First, you have to learn how to listen and then you have to think quickly to speak effectively. Table topics is a question that you answer quickly of a topic of someone else's choosing. So when I was at Charlie Basil's restaurant the other night, they have four wonderful quotes on their menu. So Dick is going to be doing an interpretive reading today, and I thought, well, we will interpret these sayings. I'm not sure who these people are, but I think the sayings are really neat. So the first saying is, I never went to work, I always went to play, by Willie Stargell. So you might tell us your interpretation of what that means and who Willie was. I heard the name, but I'm not sure who he was. So if you know, enlighten us. My first participant today, Tom Hoddle. I never went to work, I always went to play Willie Stargell. Well, Willie Stargell well, used to be a Pittsburgh Pirate. And I suppose that saying would be fitting for him since he got paid to play several million dollars, actually. But Willie, I think what Willie was getting at was that you should enjoy your work, you should always consider work play. Uh, what, what is the point of, you know, doing a job you don't like? And, you know, if you cannot go to work and then come back and have fun and feel like you've wasted, you know, eight hours of your life, which I think we've all been there, then there doesn't really seem to be any point doing it. Thank you, Tom. I wasn't sure. I just thought it was a great quote, but I wasn't quite sure what it meant. I forgot to mention that we have one minute to speak when we do our table topics, one to two minutes. So we think until we have reached one minute. 
Our second quote on the menu was, most ball games are lost, not won. Casey Stengel. Jerome, would you enlighten us to what he meant? Jerome Manigan. You would have to repeat that. I have not the slightest idea. Most ball games are lost, not won. Casey Stengel. Thank you, Karen. Uh, first of all, I have not the slightest idea what that could possibly mean. Most ball games are lost, not won. I would imagine. I can't even see that being the case either because if you have two games playing a ball game, uh, one of them must win. So I would think that the law of averages would say that in ball games, uh, at least 50% of the teams playing win. Most ball games are lost, not won. KC Stiegel, he was a ball player himself, I do believe. But I have no idea whatsoever what the hidden mystical implication of that profound saying might be. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Jerome. That kind of left me puzzled, too. And I thought, well, maybe he means the games are lost because of the errors of the players more so than them playing so brilliantly that they win. That sounds good. Like they may win by default, I, I wasn't sure. So I'm glad I wasn't the only one who was stumped by that quote. The next one is dreams are what you started. Discipline is what keeps you going. Verna, would you tell us about Jim Ryan and who he was and what he meant by that? And I can do the timing when you get up here. Would you repeat that? Dreams are what got you started. Discipline is what keeps you going. Jim Ryan. Okay. Well, I have no idea who Jim Ryan is, but um, obviously dreams are just are thoughts that you have. You want to do certain things. I have dreams of doing certain things. In fact, I um, one of my. Uh, dreams that I have had, I'm going to mention here in a second, but uh, my brother has been the source of my discipline. So the discipline is what is going to make me actually follow through on this dream because he encouraged me to write down my goals uh, last year when I was talking about some of these things. He said, you need to write them down. So I've done that. In fact, he told me in all the years that he has told people to write their goals down that I'm the first one that has actually done it and given him a copy of it. But the dream that I have had is to skydive. And I just, this is something that I have wanted to do for a number of years. So I've written that down as a goal. Now, the, the way that I'm keeping myself in discipline with this is that not only have I shared this with my brother, but I'm sharing it with you people. I've shared it with, now I'm sharing it with the whole TV audience out there. and. Um, it's something that I'm going to do. Since I'm telling everybody I'm doing this, I'm doing it. So on August the 4th, I have an appointment to go up to the airfield at, uh, in Richmond, Indiana, and I'm going to tandem skydive. And I am so excited about it that I can just hardly wait. So this is just one of my goals, and I have other goals on my list. And as I said, it's the discipline that's going to make me keep me on track and uh, to get me to follow through on these goals. Since they're written down, I will do them. And once I tell somebody, I will do it. So I'll have more to tell on that after August 4th. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Verna. You're a braver man than I am. <laughs> and our last one is, you miss 100% of the shots you never take. Wayne Gretzky. Dick Reed, would you please tell us, interpret Wayne Gretzky's quote and tell us who he was? Well, I'm afraid I don't know who Wayne Gretzky was, but I think what he is saying is that if we don't start, we'll never get there. So if we don't swing the bat, we'll never hit the ball. If we don't tee up the golf ball and strike the uh, swing the club, we'll never get to the first tee. So in order to get started, we have to, in order to achieve a goal, we have to get started. 
I think that's what he was interpreting. Thank you. I don't know if your answer would have been different if you knew that Wayne Gretzky was a goalie on a hockey team. <laughs> so that was the only person I did know who, who he was. That concludes my table topics for today. I would like to return control of the meeting to our Toastmaster, Nellie Bowen. Thank you very much. And now for our next speaker, Stanley Glitchner. Speaking in public doesn't have to be a death sentence. At Toastmasters, we can help you overcome your fears. Speakers now, and Tom Hoddle will give us the objectives for Jerome Madigan's interpretive reading of an, the burglary, an Irish poem. And would you tell me what the objectives are in reading the poem, please? Tom Hoddle for Jerome Madigan. Jerome's speech is number two from the interpretive reading manual. Interpreting poetry. His objectives are to understand the differences between poetry and prose, to recognize how poets use Im imagery, rhythm, meter, cadence, and rhyme to convey the meanings and emotions of their poetry, to apply vocal techniques that will aid in the effectiveness of the reading in a time of six to eight minutes. Thank you. And now, uh, Jerome. Jerome Madigan. Thank you, you Nellie. I am reading from a collection of poems, three authors, Austin Clark, Charles Tomlinson, and Tony Connor. The poem I am reading is The Burglary, and it was written by Austin Clark, Clark who, was, who was born in Dublin, Ireland in 1896. His first book appeared in 1917, The Burglary. It's two o'clock now. Somebody's pausing in the street to turn up his collar. The night's black, distraught with chimney toppling wind and harsh rain. See the wet soaking in on the end gable and the frothing torrent overspilling the broken drain. It accosts the pavement with incoherent babble. There is the house we want, how easy to burgle, with its dark trees and the lawn set back from the road. The owners will be in bed now, the old couple. You've got the position of the safe? Yes, I know the code. The clock's going mad up there on the church steeple. The wind's enormous. Will it ever stifle? Still, it's noise, and the rains are with us, I dare say. They'll cover what we make if we go careful round by the greenhouse and in the back way. Here's the broken sash I mentioned. No need to be fearful. Watch how I do it. These fingers are facile. With the practice I've had on worse nights than this, I tell you, the whole thing's going to be a dawdle. The way I've got it worked out, we can't miss. Although God knows most things turn out a muddle, and it only confuses more to look for a moral. Wherever I've been, the wind and rain's blown. I've done my best to hang on as they try to whittle the name from the action the flesh away from the bone. But I think sometimes I'm fighting a losing battle. So many bad nights, so many strange homes to burgle, and every job done with a mate I don't know. Oh, you're all right. I don't mean to be personal, but when the day breaks, you'll have your orders and go. Then the next time the foul weather howls in the gentle and the slate slide, the brimming gutters gurgle, 
there'll be another lad I've never seen before with the rest of the knowledge that makes the job possible as I ease up a window or skeleton key a door. Still, it's the only life I know, and I've no quarrel with the boss's methods apart from the odd quibble and the allowances and fair rates of pay are the difficult routes I often have to travel or the fact that I never get a holiday. Most of the time, though, I'm glad of mere survival. Even at the stormiest hour of the darkest vigil, here's the hall door. Under the stairs, you said, this one's easy because the old folks are feeble and lie in their curtained room, sleeping like the dead. Sometimes, believe me, it's a lot more trouble when you've got to be silent and move as though through treacle. Now, hold your breath while I let these tumblers click. I've done these many a time, a well-known model. One more turn now, yes. That does the trick. Nothing inside, the same recurrent muddle. I think the most careful plan's a bloody marvel. If it plays you true, if nothing at all goes wrong. Well, let's be off. We've another place to tackle. Under the blown black rain, and the dawn won't be long. And the wind will drop and the rain become a drizzle, and you'll go your way, leaving me the bedraggled remnant of night that walked within the head, long after the sunshot gutter ceased to trickle, and I draw my curtains and topple into bed. The Burglary by Austin Clark. Thank you, our next speaker will be Dick Reed with the Ultimate Credit Card, and he is to be evaluated by Verna Gibson. <laughs> Verna, uh, will you read the objectives for Dick's speech? Dick Reed is doing project number four from Speaking to Inform. This is a fact-finding report. The objectives are uh, to prepare a report on a situation, event, or problem of interest to the audience, deliver sufficient factual information in your report so the audience can make valid conclusions or a second decision, answer questions from the audience. Time is five to, t five to seven minutes for the speech and two to three minutes for the question and answer period. Uh, many, perhaps most of us, enjoy the convenience of a credit card. A credit card often lets us purchase items more easily. It assures the seller, it, it assures the seller will be paid promptly and can give the holder a means of tracking expenses. Yet, there are limitations. Our speaker today, Dick Reed, is going to tell us about a credit card that has no limitations. Please join me in welcoming Dick Reed, who will describe the ultimate credit card. Dick Reed. Thank you. I started the day with a trip to one of my favorite stores. Since I'm an electrical engineer, one might guess that my favorite store is a Radio Shack store because they have little electronic components and they have big electronic components. But today, I was going there to buy a new stereo system. My old one died and it was time to replace it. So I went to the uh, display and picked out a nice 200 watt speaker, frequency response of 15 kilohertz, 15 hertz up to 20,000 kilohertz. I said, that, that will do, I'll take a pair of them. The salesman said, well, 
you know, modern systems have surround sound, so perhaps you should have four speakers. So I said, okay, I'll take four. I bought a uh, receiver with a half microwatt sensitivity, uh, CD player, surround sounds editions. I had a really nice system. I put all the equipment on the uh, checkout bench and offered my credit card. He swiped the card in the system and said, well, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Mr. Reed, but there seems to be a problem. Uh, the system seems to have maxed out your credit card. So I left without my equipment. But later on that day when I got home, I found a letter in the mailbox that said, pre-approved. Sounds good. Letter started out, Dear Mr. Reed, we have a credit card for you with no upper limit. That's nice, right? If you uh, run out of money, just ask to have your limit raised. If you can't pay the interest on that debt, we'll just add it. To your credit card. It has a low interest rate, typically 3-4%. That sounds good. And I read a little farther in the letter, and it said, your current balance is $44,000. I said, whoops, there's a catch here, isn't there? For how did that happen? I just got this thing, in fact, uh, what, what's going on here? So I read a little farther down, and I said, who is this from? And it said, your friendly federal government. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the, in the credit card that I'm talking about is that that is used by the federal government. In fact, each taxpayer owes about $44,000. Scary, isn't it? Every one of us who pays taxes has a share of our federal government's debt, which currently is about $5,724,000,000,000. But I don't owe all of that money. Some of you do too, because there are about 130 million of us to spread that money about. Well, what is the federal deficit? I mean, what is that uh, deb uh, debt? <coughs> Long time ago, I took an economics class, and our economics instructor uh, ex was trying to explain that. And he said, our debt is money that we owe ourselves. So I kind of say, well, if I take $100 out of my right hand and put it in my left hand and say, I've loaned myself $100, I say, that's cool. Now, a year later, I have to pay that money back with interest, so I pay myself back $105, and I say, why should I do that? Why don't I just forget the whole thing? If I owe it to myself, it doesn't make sense that I should pay myself back more than I borrowed in the first place. Well, that sounds like an oversimplified thing, doesn't it? Because the federal budget, the federal debt, is a little bit more complicated than that. Let's examine who we actually owe that money to. Where does that money come from? Well, part of it came from other countries. Japan, Korea, uh, other countries have invested in us. But I say, well, if we owe it to ourselves, why don't we just kind of tear up their share of it? They don't need it anyway, right? They got more money than we have, so we can ignore that. Who else is there? Well, 
here's some certificates saying that General Motors borrowed a lot of money from the federal government. They've got more money than they know what to do with anyway, don't they? Well, that's, this is fun, right? We've already taken care of a good chunk of our national debt. What's this one? Whoops. Uh-oh. This one's my retirement fund. Can I get a little piece of tape from somebody to... We don't need to take care of all of it today, do we? I mean, come on. We can, uh, we can let a little of that go. So our national debt, our federal deficit, our federal debt is owed, yes, to ourselves and to other countries, but it is something that we are going to have to pay back. Now, my share of that debt is $44,000. Your share for each and every one of you is $44,000. What are you going to do about your share? I know what I'm going to do about my share. I'm going to pass it on to my children and my grandchildren. Oh. Madam Toastmaster. <laughs> Were there any questions about is there any time limit on when we uh, have to uh, make this payment uh, back? Oh, absolutely. Every year we have to pay out uh, interest on the debt to uh, those who hold the debt, to General Motors, to my retirement fund, and to your retirement funds. But where does that money come from? Often from more debt borrowed by somebody else. So yes, there's a time limit in the sense that we have to continually make payments on it, but so far it's been carried on for quite a few years. Any other questions? Yes. Do you have any suggestions as to what we might do besides just pass this on to our children and grandchildren? Oh, I like that one best, but <laughs> there are other ways. Uh, we can raise taxes. We can uh, increase, you know, gasoline taxes, for one thing, could be raised, and that would be a significant source. That's kind of one of my favorites uh, because it does two things. One, it would, if the money would be used to pay off the national debt, it uh, would get that done in a fairly short order. The second thing, it would encourage us to become less dependent on oil, which is a major problem, as, uh, as we have found out recently. Do you think Americans have become so complacent that a revolution such as the one that occurred in the 1700s, the Boston Tea Party specifically, could occur again? Do I think a, a major revolution will occur again? No, I don't think so. I think we are um, as you say, too complacent for that to happen. There are some organizations, however, that are working quietly to help alleviate the situation, such as the National Taxpayers Union. Um, but I think some of the things that we can do is just bring pressure quietly on the government, maybe not so quietly, to uh, help reduce the national debt. I had heard that we won't get out of debt because it's other people's money and that if a, any congressman would cut the budget, his budget, he wouldn't have that much next year when he might need it. So they're always increasing their budget. And I haven't noticed that anyone has cut their budget. Have you seen any evidence that anyone has cut a budget any place? There is a tendency in the government to, if you don't spend the money in your budget, that you don't get it replaced. That came home to me because I'm teaching in a, in a school, and uh, one of my fellow teachers before I came there, uh, when they asked to, for budget cuts, he cut the amount of the budget in his department. Now the unfortunate part is he cut it so much that we really 
didn't have enough money to get by. So some of that money had to come out of our personal uh, pockets. Um, and yeah, it, we don't get it back. So we are hurting a bit. And that is a reason why if you get a certain amount of money budgeted, you never want to voluntarily <laughs> decrease it, even if you can do it temporarily because it doesn't come back. So that's one of the factors of the way that our government is run that will continue with our deficit situation. Any other questions? And I'll return control to our token. Thank you, Nick. I'd like to begin uh, tonight with a uh, little joke. Um, this guy, he's a farmer. He says, hey, hello, hello, sorry. But ser seriously, folks. Um, uh, Speaking in public is no joke. The doc farmer says, a uh, doctor says, the chicken says. For help, call Toastmasters, the public speaking support group. <laughs> the chicken. Now, uh, Tom Hoddle will give us an evaluation of Jerome's interpretive reading of the poem. Tom. Jerome, that was an excellent reading of uh, the burglary. Uh, you have a very dramatic style of speaking. Uh, when you give your other speeches, and I think that lent itself. And one of the things that, one of the benefits of that was that it kept you from getting into a sing-songy rhythm. You just have a natural speaking voice that picked up the rhythm of the song, or the rhythm of the poem. And one of the things I liked was that you emphasized certain words like foul weather to kind of give us the connotation of what was going on. One of the things I probably would have done was possibly when he started talking about turning the tumblers, is get a little bit cocky and like, oh, turn the tumblers. Just hold on, I've done this before. But it was that, again, it was that dramatic style. Uh, I think you keep your rhythm natural. One of the things they ask about is uh, what kind of eye contact did you make with the audience? Now you looked up once in a while, but the objectives are actually in the, yeah, in the objectives, they said to kind of look more at the book to keep going, and which is good because I think that allowed you to get through it more smoothly than a lot of people tend to do when they're reading in front of an audience. They tend to, uh, uh, um, much like I'm doing right now. So overall, I thought that was a very excellent dramatic presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just a short note, a lot of people say they don't like poetry, and I think it's because they don't read it correctly. They don't see the imagery. They don't understand what the poet is trying to say. But once you learn how to do that, you're going to find there's a lot more in poetry when you read it than there is in prose, and you'll get addicted, right? It's beautiful, and it's very disciplined writing. Our next evaluation will be Verna Gibson, who will give us an evaluation for Dick. Verna? The ultimate credit card. Dick, I think you did a great job. This is uh, definitely not an easy subject, but I think you um, brought us the information in a way in which we could understand. And, uh, some of the, the objectives are, how well did the speaker explain the purpose of the report to the audience? Well, you began by buying um, stereo equipment and having the credit card declined, and I think we could all understand that. And then you re surprised us by uh, telling us that this is actually the federal debt that each of us owe this $44,000. So that was a good twist, and it added a bit of surprise to the purpose of your report. Was the report organized clearly and logically? Yes, 
Dick, you seem to have a good knowledge of the facts, and the report flowed from a good introduction to a rather humorous conclusion. And I say humorous tongue in cheek, obviously. If the speaker used visual aids, did they help the audience to understand the information more easily and quickly? Yes, the visual aids were introduced as a surprise. This credit card was actually from the federal government, and I think that was a great technique to surprise us with this. And then uh, I thought it was rather humorous when you attempted to tape your retirement fund back together again. Was enough information given on which the audience could base a sound decision or draw valid conclusions? Yes. We're, we were told that we do have time limits to this debt. We were um, told what the, the federal debt is, how many people actually owe a share of this debt, and how much we owe, including myself. So I found out today that I owe $44,000, which I didn't really realize that before. How prepared did, did the speaker appear to be for the questions that were asked? Well, he answered the questions, uh, and he said that we could raise taxes, we could become less dependent on oil, and he also explained how departments in um, uh, different companies and in the government don't turn money back in because if they do, then they don't get that money again. They don't get it back, and indeed the next year they may actually get less money. And I've heard this before because my first husband actually worked for GE and they depended a lot on, on uh, uh, money from the government, so they never turned it back in. How effective was the speaker in, surround, in responding in a positive manner to the questions that were asked? Well, you smiled. You had solutions that were answered in a calm, confident, positive attitude. How well did the speaker conclude the question and answer period? Well, uh, of course, the, um, the beginning of your report told us how th we could um, uh, pass this debt on to our children and grandchildren, and then you did explain why these departments um, will always spend all the money that they're given, and that is because they're going to get less the next time. They will never see that money again. Uh, Dick, I think you did a great job, and I enjoyed being the evaluator for your speech. Thank you. Thank you, Erna. And now we will have our timers report, because we're always timed on our speeches, and everything we do, we have to be disciplined and keep it within a set time limit. And Carol, will you give us a time on everything today? Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. I would like to report that the table topics were, you have one to two minutes to answer the question. Tom and Jerome used less than a minute to answer their question, and Ver uh, Tom, Jerome, and Dick, and Verna was the only one who had qualified with the time. She had a minute and 39 seconds. The Word power, and I forgot to time you, Steve, on your cack handed, which I didn't hear anyone say today, or your vermiculture. The speech by Jerome was to be six to eight minutes, and Jerome, you finished in five minutes and seven seconds. The speech by Dick Reed was to be five to seven minutes, and that was seven minutes and eight seconds. The question and answer was to be two to three minutes, and that was four minutes and 15 seconds. The evaluations should be two to three minutes. Tom, your evaluation for Jerome's poem was a minute and 30 seconds. And the Verna, your evaluation for Dick was three minutes and 15 seconds. And that concludes my timer report. Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, All the education in the world won't help you get ahead in life if you can't express your ideas effectively. Every day, competition for advancement gets tougher and tougher. You need an edge. A Toastmasters Club can give you that edge. A low-cost learning experience for men and women, Toastmasters gives you the confidence to express your ideas to anyone. Get the Toastmasters edge. Uh, Joe Buell will have our joke for the day. Joe? 
add a little levity to the meeting? <laughs> Thank you very much, Madame Thirst Masters, distinguished members of this wonderful club. I always try to make humor from experiences I have from my family. <clears throat> and this time, uh, I like to reminisce the old days when my children were young. It just so happened that this time I was coming, we were out in a, in a drive, uh, we were out in Kansas. That's when we used to live in Missouri. So we took a drive to Kansas, and on the way back, there was, uh, you could see, down there there's no hills, <laughs> not very many hills anyway, and it is flat and you could see the uh, skyline of Kansas City in the distance, and there were clouds on top of it, and it was raining cats and dogs, and I said, my goodness, Iris, I told my wife, it's raining cats and dogs in Kansas City. It was a silence. All of a sudden, a little two-year-old's voice <laughs> says, poor little dog is falling down. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Well, of course, I'm a cat lover, so poor little kitty cats. <laughs> we'll have a few closing words from uh, our outgoing president. Rick Davis. Thank you, Nellie. Rick. Thank you for a, uh, a great show today. And I would like to present the gavel of the presidency to Carol Cormelink, who is going to be president for 2003-2004. Congratulations, Carol. I'll let you adjourn the meeting. Thank you, Rick. It will be my privilege to serve as president of the club for next year. I, my one goal is to have good teamwork and to actually have good communication like we teach in Toastmasters, that we call each other back quickly <laughs> and not have to call one or two times to get a response. I, I would like to see that we do a little better on that. On that. So our next meeting will be Monday, August 4th, our next meeting here at the studio will be August the, what date is that on there? I don't have my paper in front of me. August the 16th at the studio here. And we do invite the public to come visit us and be our guest. And with that, the meeting is adjourned.